Greetings and welcome to this time of worship here at Morgan Hill United Methodist Church. As we celebrate this fourth Sunday of Advent already, we're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today and we're blessed to have you take part in our worship. As we affirm that here Christ welcomes all and all are welcome, may the love of God, the grace of Christ, the friendship and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with you. At Morgan Hill United Methodist Church, our vision as a faith community is to create an inclusive, reconciling, and progressive spiritual community that welcomes all people based on the teachings of Jesus to love one another. Here, human diversity matters. Here, open minds matter. Here, prayerful hearts, guided by spirit and rooted in scripture, tradition, reason, and human experience matters. And here, God does not discriminate. To help you follow our worship experience, you can click on the closed caption option at the bottom of your screen and the words will appear to help you follow the worship service today. So let us join our hearts and spirits together in this time of worship as Chuck and Darcy Foster light the fourth candle, candle on the Advent wreath, the candle of peace. As we light the fourth candle of the Advent wreath, the candle of peace, we are reminded that we stand at the threshold between ordinary time and God's eternal time. Too often we forget that the love we give and receive is a sign of eternity, that God is with us right now. And we forget that company is not only coming, but the company we are expecting has arrived. The Gospel of Luke tells us that God came to a young girl, an ordinary girl, living in a small town. An angel of the Lord came and greeted her, saying, Greetings, Mary, the Lord is with you. What a beautiful gift to receive, that God is with us. We light these candles with peace in our hearts for the gift of Emmanuel, knowing that God is with us, even when we forget to listen and lean into the presence of God. To know that God is as close as our own breath brings us the confidence our hearts desire while living in a confusing world, that God's peace that passes all understanding is the peace in knowing that company has arrived. Please pray with me. Come, Emmanuel, and penetrate our hearts fully this Advent season, and let our lives reflect the radiance of your glory and peace. We pray. Amen. Thank you, Darcy and Chuck, for lighting our, our fourth Advent uh, candle. Please sing along to the words as they appear on your screen and Denise Melroy and Steve Cole will bring us a, a beautiful and familiar gospel hymn, The Virgin Mary Had a Baby Boy.
Denise and, and Steve for leading us in that wonderful gospel hymn. Our gospel reading today comes from the gospel of Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In Luke chapter 1, uh, 6 through 25, the angel Gabriel announces to Zacharias uh, and his wife Elizabeth that they're going to bear a son, and they're to name that uh, boy John, and that would become John the Baptist. So there's the connection to Jesus. John is uh, Jesus' cousin. John will come in the spirit of Elijah, says the angel, to prepare the way for the Messiah. Luke now writes about a very similar event when Gabriel announces to a, a young unmarried girl that she would be the mother of the Messiah. Now the par parallels uh, of both uh, announcements uh, share some similarities and they're also contrasted. Between the two accounts are, are, nu are numerous and, and, but they're also purposeful. And Zacharias is the, the priestly, educated, elderly man, and he's shown to have less faith and obedience than Mary, the young, unmarried, unschooled girl. This reveals a great theme of, of reversal that is promised in, uh, in Luke, when God uses those that the world would not use, as well as Luke's emphasis on women as being vitally important for the purposes of God. Both would have been jarring and radical ideas uh, in Luke's day. The overall picture that Luke reveals is that God is at work, not just for Zacharias and Elizabeth or Mary, but for all of Israel, and especially for all who are oppressed. God is intervening in human history to bring forth an everlasting kingdom. I invite you now to hear this reading from the New Testament interpretation, the message. Now it was in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to be married, to a man descended from King David. His name was Joseph, the virgin's name was Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her. Greetings, you're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a, a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of, the, of his father David, and he will rule Jacob's house forever, no end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, But how? I've never slept with a man. And the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will hover over you, and therefore the child you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. And did you know that your cousin, as Elizabeth, conceived a son, old as she is? Everyone called her barren, and here she is, six months pregnant. Nothing you see is impossible. With God. And Mary said, Yes, I, I see it all now. I'm the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. And then the angel left her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Patrick. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church whose faith we support with our prayers, our presence, our giving, our witness, and our service. Thank you to those of you who've been leaving um, dry goods, gro grocery items 
on the front porch for our church to go teams to pick up each Saturday. We're happy to pick up your grocery bags and deliver it to our community food bank. However, just so you know, we won't be picking up on December 27th or January 3rd. We will pick it up again starting January 10th. More on that in a little bit. It's through this way of connection learning and giving that people of the United Methodist Church make a huge difference. So I invite you to give generously as we worship God through, through sharing our gifts, tithes, our prayers for one another, our presence online, and our witness and our service. And although we cannot put our gifts in the offering plate on Sunday, we can visit our giving page on this website and see the opportunities to give either directly online or using your mobile device or through your bank's online bill payment system and always by mail or even just by dropping it through the slot. Remember, gifts come from us as the people of God for the work of God to the glory of God in the world. Please pray with me. Gracious and generous God, we offer our gifts to you, knowing full well we have devoted so much energy into finding the gifts for our families and much less on the gifts we offer to you. You gave Mary, an unmarried girl, a son so that the world might have a savior. Her response was so simple, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. May her affirmation of faith and obedience be the gift that we offer this day. In Christ we pray, amen. And please listen now as Dave and Janet Tuttle provide a special music offertory entitled The First Noah. Janet, and uh, uh, we appreciate that. You and Dave uh, Tuttle play uh, together. It's always a, it's always a joy to, to hear you two do a duet when uh, we get a chance to, to play together. You're both so talented, and you bless us with your talents. Thank you again. Always remember that nothing separates us from the love of God that's been shown to us in Christ Jesus. Please keep in your prayers for peace and comfort and strength and healing. Those struggling with life-threatening illnesses, as well as those who have recently lost loved ones and are struggling with their own grief and sadness as a family. Please remember in your prayers for strength and, and healing that we keep in our prayers Candy and Greg, Bodie and Renee, Denise's uncle and cousin, who are fighting the COVID virus, Alex, Kat, Ellen, Cricket, Mitzi, Jalen, and Dan. 
And for peace and comfort, we keep in our prayers the Abel's family, the Moore family, Mike's family, the Lopez family, and the Ricker family. Also keep in prayer the concerns of the world as we pray for more than 1.6 million families who have lost loved ones worldwide or over 303,000 families in the United States who have lost their loved ones from this COVID-19 virus. And for the people everywhere struggling with this infection. And we raise our thankful hearts for a vaccine that is now getting distributed throughout the world to those that can receive it and maybe reduce these infections. We pray for the safety also of our police and our firefighters, our school teachers, and for the safety of our children. And we pray for those who work in our grocery stores, our first responders, our doctors, and our nurses, and all the medical personnel who, who are continuing to live in the, the midst of this pandemic. We give thanks to those brave people across the globe who signed up to be in the COVID-19 vaccine trials. And we pray that this is the, the beginning of, of getting that COVID under control. Please continue to email your prayer concerns to us here at the, at the church office so that I and our prayer team may keep your concerns in prayer this week. And for the prayer shared in those that remain in the silent places of our heart, we say to the Lord, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Please pray with me. O oh, come to us, Abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel, God with us. You came to us long ago as a helpless babe, as one in need of human love and care. You taught us how to love and care for one another. Help us to hold on to childlike wonder, amazement, and love, and help us to love one another all year long. Guide our feet into the way of peace, as only the Prince of Peace can lead us by lying down our lives for one another and serving one another. In the name of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, we pray in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Over the last few Sundays, we've had an opportunity to, to talk to the children and the young people about how we've prepared the chancel area for the, the season of Advent. We've talked about the Advent wreath, what each of the four candles mean. And you see we have four candles that are lit. So the next one to be lit will be Christ candle, which means Christmas is coming. Then we talked about the manger scene, which is behind me, the nativity scene. We also call it a crèche. And we've talked about the chrismon tree and what it means. But I want to tell you a special story about the poinsettia. This is called the flower of the holy night. It's come to mean a lot to Christians, and you'll see it in their churches and in the season of Advent. But what does it mean? What's the story behind the poinsettia? And as the story is told, and the, as the legend goes, there was a little girl. She was very poor. And it was Christmas Eve, and people were gathering at the, at the church in the village, and uh, this little girl was from Mexico. And so she was walking along with her cousin, and they were making their way to the church Christmas Eve night. She didn't have anything to give to the, to the baby Jesus. She was so poor, there wasn't much that she could think of. And as she went, she prayed, 
that there could be something that she might be able to give. And so she thought as she went along, she saw weeds, <laughs> just weeds along the roadside. And she stopped and very humbly and with a lot of love, she gathered up the weeds and bundled it up like a bouquet. And when it came time to deliver their gifts or present their gifts before the baby Jesus, she walked down the aisle of the church and then out from under her blanket that she was wearing to keep her warm, she laid the bouquet of flowers before the Holy Child. But miraculously, what she laid before the baby Jesus was this beautiful poinsettia. And that's why it's called the flower of the holy night. It's a miracle flower. Sometimes we may think that what we have to give doesn't much matter. And she cried on her way because she was upset that all she was going to be able to give that, that baby Jesus was some weeds. But her cousin said to her, no, any gift that you give, as long as you give it with great love, God sees it and God blesses it. And that's the story of the poinsettia. And to this day, you'll always see a poinsettia beside a manger scene or in front of a manger scene at a church. Or you'll see a whole church chancellery covered with these beautiful red flowers, flowers of the holy night. I hope you'll go to the store and pick yourself out a poinsettia, take it home, and put it beside your nativity scene. God bless you. Here we are, now in the middle of this seven-week sermon series. We haven't had one that long before. But we have talked about recognizing that this place is a mess and then we had to get our sleeves rolled up so we could start to work and be on those cleanup crews. And last week, we finally got to deck the halls, a little thing, something to make something pretty. And this week, well, it's almost Christmas. We hit critical mass somewhere around this last week before the day itself. We run on overload or find a little bit of magic and have a miracle working to make it all come out the way we hope and pray that it will. Those seem to be our choices in this season, doesn't it? Overwhelmed or by the skin of our teeth? Or is it just me? I don't know. Why? Because it's Christmas. That's always the answer that we give when, we, when someone asks, which surely doesn't help. It's almost the same as your mom saying, because I told you so. Why do we do it then? Well, because remember, company's coming, and we want the house to look nice. Now, that may seem shallow, but it is what motivates us, appearances. It's not supposed to sound shallow because there is something important going on there. In the desire to present a welcoming home, a home of joy and light, full of the sights and sounds and smells of the season, there is something profound being said about the nature of Christmas itself. Appearances. How would it look to someone <laughs> This just kind of describes my house like right now, but we're working on it. How would it look if someone showed up before you got everything spruced up? How would it look if they were found the boxes from the attic were not put away and the decorations were strewn across the floor and the kitchen's a mess because the kids asked to help you know, with the baking and the cat knocked over the ornaments or the dog knocked them off with the tail with abandon and temper started running short and the strain beginning to show, and if you press replay on Jingle Bell Rock just one more time, I won't be responsible for my actions. How would that look? It's crazy, I'll tell you, because I'm living it. This is essentially the question that David asked in the Second Samuel reading this week. He was relaxing in his lazy boy throne watching the Philistines losing to the Amechalites in the fourth quarter, and he happens to glance out the window into the backyard, and he sees what God has been living in since he moved back from wherever it was that he got stolen to. And he thought, hmm, how does this look? Here I am, I'm living in my brand new house, with the full finished basement, full baths on every floor, 
walk-in closets and a three-car garage. And there's God living in a pop-up trailer in my backyard. Oh, there's just something not right here. Or maybe it was his grumpy wife, and she told him that she didn't like the look of God's camper next to her rose bushes. And ever since God strung those lights up on the canopy, it started to look like a little trailer park out there. Now, how does it look to have me in here and God out there? Not good, was his conclusion. So David said, well, we just got to build God a house. And Nathan, who runs messages back and forth to the camper in the back and into the palace, says, good idea. Well, at least until he trundles out to the backyard and has a word with God. And God says, no. He says he's kind of partial to his pop-up camper. He likes being able to go where the people are. He likes to be on the move, and he doesn't want to be tied down with the maintenance worries that home ownership brings. He prefers to be able to run out in the front to head off the bad guy at the pass. And who's the one in the home building business anyway? Wasn't it I who led you home to the promised land? Wasn't it I who made it safe enough to build your tri-level ranch-style palace anyway? Well, I'm the one in the home establishing business, not you. In fact, you might even say that that's my main motivating factor in all this chosen people stuff in the first place. To make a home, a home for you and my people, and through you, make a home to the whole world. God says, come home. That's the offer God makes to David. Come home. Come home to me. Home to your true self. Home to your true family. And that's what God is really talking about, home. David is talking about building a house, and God wants to talk about finding a home. God built in all of us this desire for a home. And maybe at Christmas this desire for home is just a little bit stronger or a little bit closer to the surface. And sometimes we have to move heaven and earth to get there. And it upsets our routines, and we still wonder on occasion whether it's all worth it. And yet we go, or they come, and we find a new place. God told David that David wasn't going to build God a home. And then it was said in the verses that we had skipped over that David's son was going to do it. Then later, David and everyone thought that God was talking about Solomon, because Solomon did indeed build the temple as a home for God. Well, at least that's what everyone thought God meant. Everyone but Luke. Luke reminds us that God had different ideas than the rest of us did. Solomon's temple was quite the structure, and God apparently liked it well enough, well, enough to visit, but it really never was God's home, or so it seems. Well, for one thing, it was always called Solomon's temple, not God's temple. No, God has a different son in mind when he said, your son will build my home. God was thinking of the one Gabriel would call the son of the Most High. That one would reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom, and there would be no end. That's the son who would build God's home. No one quite got that then. David didn't understand what God meant. Solomon didn't really understand either. But he got the construction crew out anyway. No one knew what God really meant. No one but Mary. But then, the indications are that Mary really didn't understand it either. Well, how could she? Just imagine, this young and married, soon-to-be married girl gets a message from God, and the message is, God's coming home. Oh, and he's taking up residence in you. I'm saying, excuse me? No, this nothing special backwoods teenager was going to be God's home for a few months. And talk about your troubling house guests. Feet on the furniture is nothing compared to this. And those who are mothers and have experienced the joy of pregnancy and birth know better than the rest of us the hard realities of this little event. Here, we are here a few days before Christmas talking about Mary and finding out that she's going to be pregnant. 
And then Wednesday night, she gives birth. Pretty amazing, really. But it's not real. She carried this load just like everyone else. She didn't get out of it. She still hurt and sweated and paced and groaned and struggled and wondered and worried. And then she gave birth in a barn because nobody was willing to give her a bed. Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. The Lord has a different idea of favoritism than we do. The Lord has a different idea of blessing than we do. Well, and the Lord has a different idea of home than we do. Come home, says the Lord to us at Christmas time. David wanted to build a house for God, the tallest hill in Jerusalem, where God could be removed and distant and overlook all the people who would have to go out of their way to give obedience to God. But God just wanted to build his home a little closer to the deep realities of living in this world so that we would be surprised by God where we live. God wanted to build his home where we sweat and labor, where we work and we play, where we laugh and cry, and where our hearts are lifted up and often broken and sometimes healed. David wanted God's home on a mountain, but God wanted his home in the womb of a virgin, in the feed box, behind an inn, in the little town of Bethlehem. God wanted his home in the backwoods region of Galilee, on the roads of the countryside, and in the grassy place where 5,000 ate and ate their fill. God wanted his home in the birthing units and wedding celebrations and the dinner parties. God wanted his home in the tear-filled bedrooms and the sick beds and the graveyards of his children. God wanted his home in the courtrooms and prison cells and then on the streets of sorrow of Jerusalem and the dark hill called Calvary. God wants his home in your home, in the living rooms and kitchens, the playrooms and bedrooms of your life. God, God calls to us at Christmas and says, Greetings, favored ones! I'm coming home, coming home for Christmas. Is there room for me in your crowded, busy lives? Is there room for me? And like any baby born in our midst, he says, I won't take up much room, just all that you have. Is there room for me? I'm coming home. And off to the side, almost out of our vision, an angel waits for our answer. Now it's time for celebrations. Uh, I would, we have three great birthdays all in a row. I would like to wish a very happy birthday to Adriana, whose birthday is December 23rd. And then the very next day, I would like to wish a very happy birthday to Jacob, whose birthday is on Christmas Eve. I remember when you were born. And our last one in our series, whose birthday is on Christmas Day, is Mary Lucian. I'd like to wish everyone a very happy birthday this year. If you have a celebration that you would like to have a shout out for, please email me at the office at office at nhumc.com. So receive this benediction. In all your Advent preparations, remain watchful with your eyes on Christ, whose birth is in a manger, but a promise of his coming again in glory. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Until Jesus Comes. Please sing the words, which hopefully you almost know by now, um, as they appear on your screen. The Lord is coming soon. Come, Lord, do not tarry. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Until Jesus comes, until Jesus comes, I'll be watching and waiting until Jesus comes.